NB strikes me as a man hater because she would like to be one. <laughs> and as a result, hates women also, hence the attacks on women. That is some epic logic. I didn't know I wanted to be a man. <sighs> Hi there, uh, this is Mary Black, and these are some transphobic and mean tweets, uh, especially to do with the recent reforms in the Gender Recognition Act. What does when necessary mean? Who decides? I will never accept that I have to share intimate spaces with men, even if they are harmless. It violates my rights to privacy as a woman. Why is that not an issue for you? Because, Pam, you don't have the right to be in a room alone wherever you go. That's just not how the world works. Fuck you and all your kind and their shite. There's only two genders and only one combination of genitals fits. David is going to struggle to fuck all of us if that is the case. Hi, Mary, I'm honestly very friendly too, but you need to take your head out your arse and listen to what the women organisations like Women Place are saying. Sex is being overwritten by new gender ideology. I am also of the opinion that people should not be able to change sex in law. Well, actually, it is by listening to women organisations that I've arrived at the position that I support reforms to the GRA and that I support trans rights. Um, and if you're of the opinion that people should not be able to change sex in law, then that's transphobic and you can't get annoyed when people point out your bigotry there. Since then, the definition of trans has widened so much that technically I could lay claim to a trans identity if I felt so inclined. Well, I? My question, genuine, is why should we be allowing men with autogynephilia into women's spaces? If they can self-ID and change their sex marker on their birth certificate, they will. Their sexual fetish includes being accepted as women. This is just old school homophobia rebranded. This idea that it's a, a perversion and that there's some sexual kick out of, you know, being more likely to die, being more likely to kill yourself, being more likely to be murdered, be more likely to uh, endure male violence and transphobic violence, that's not a sexual fetish. Um, and even this term, autogynephilia, anyone who ends up going back to autogynephilia is somebody who has a very, very shallow and narrow view of the world. If you think that, then you're as thick as mince. If you believe it, you're a lost soul. Happy being a lost soul. NB strikes me as a man-hater because she would like to be one <laughs> and as a result hates women also, hence the attacks on women. That is some epic logic. I didn't know I wanted to be a man. <sighs> trans women marry. There is literally no risk from trans men, either to male or female. The risk solely exists from trans women who are male, people who, according to the MOJ government stats, sexually offend as a demographic to the same order of magnitude as other biological males. I mean, that is just the most dangerous warping of arguments and the, the most dangerous misunderstanding of statistics that I've seen in a while. Um, and also, what is very clear is it reeks of misogyny as well with that, the idea that a trans man is no threat to a male or female. Therefore, the idea being that a woman can be of no threat to a male or female, which of course is ridiculous. Um, so I, that's, that's a dodgy view. Every time I log on to Twitter and my notifications are always inundated with people to do with trans issues, and we've seen some of the stuff that gets sent daily, but that stuff's out there and getting seen by young trans people, older trans people, folk who are just struggling with life at the minute and don't actually know where they fit into things yet. And the reason that they can't, or they, they feel afraid to even begin that journey is because of these kinds of attitudes. Um, and the one thing that is very clear through reading that is that there is a hell of a lot of misunderstanding. There's a lot of ignorance to do with trans issues, which isn't necessarily, necessarily bad. It's only bad if you then refuse to educate yourself on it. Um, and, but most of all, at the heart of all this, there is a real core group of transphobes. And when we give legitimacy to these kind of views, that becomes the narrative and we don't go anywhere.
In order to get to the kind of society that I think we all want to see, fundamentally it's got to start with just being nice to people, just going to be sound. Ultimately, just don't be a Jeremy Hunt. Mary Black. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Um, we've just been through some of the abuse that people receive on social media, but I was wondering if perhaps you could outline for us in real life sort of some of the daily abuse, the prejudice that trans people face in their day-to-day -day lives. I mean, at this moment in time, I don't think trans people experience anything other than, you know, people being horrible to them. Um, because the, the debate is... Well, first of all, I've got a problem calling it a debate, right? Because human rights shouldn't be up for debate. If you want to have a discussion about them and try to understand them more, then by all means. But uh, a debate makes me uncomfortable because it's like debating gay rights. No, you've either got them or you've not. Mm. Um, so I, I do, I think the discussion has become so toxic. It has become... Um, there's so many myths. There's so many just horrible stereotypes that are permeating and outright transphobia um, is now permeating through not just things like Twitter, but God, you open the news, by reading the newspapers, you would think that trans people were, uh, you know, some absolute plague that are coming to destroy us all when they, <laughs> there is no evidence to suggest that. So I do, I think life is very, very tough for uh, trans and non-binary people just now, more generally. We can talk about the newspapers in a bit, mm -hmm. but I'd like perhaps to start almost, if, not with a definition of terms, but what's acceptable, the term, because I think a lot of people, well-intentioned people, mm -hmm. are often causing offence yeah. by using words that historically have been a part of our lexicon, mm -hmm. but that now, rightly so, you know, are not the appropriate words. So, yeah. you know, what is what is the right way to talk to talk about this? What is the right way to have that discussion? What are the terms that we should be using? Well, I mean, the three main terms that are thrown about. The first one is obviously trans, right? The trans means that you are you identify with the different gender than your physical biology would suggest at birth. Um, but it's also more encompassing than that because it takes, it basically means people who haven't got a normal gender experience um, and people have different paths that they take. Some, it involves surgery, some it's hormones, some it's just living their lives as they want to be. Um, so uh, trans people is the first one. Um, the second thing is the opposite of trans, which is cis. Now, I've seen that some people seem to be getting offended by being called a, a cis woman, but it's literally Latin. It just means the opposite of, so it's how we differentiate a, a difference between a trans woman and a cis woman like me. It, it shouldn't be a contentious uh, subject, but suddenly you've got women going, hey, excuse me, women will do just fine. And you think, right, okay, but really all the hostility is coming for you here, it's not me. And, it's, uh, and I think in that sense, from the get-go, a lot of the people who have concerns about trans issues are also the same people who will complain that they're not getting uh, the chance to be heard, when in actual fact it feels like all we're hearing from is those people and they're not giving people the chance to, to be able to explain what their different experience has been. What was the third one then? Oh, aye, the third one uh, that gets used a lot is TERF because uh, it took me ages to figure out what that was. And it stands for a Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist. Now, a lot of women are now saying that they feel that TERF is a slur and it's an offence to them. Um, and in that, see if someone tells you, look, I find that offensive, so gonna not say it. Cool, uh, it's, it's not the hill that I'm, I'm gonna die on, um, but I personally can't see why you would have an issue with it because it's literally a descriptive word. It's, you are a trans-exclusionary radical feminist. You're a feminist that's claiming that you want to exclude trans people. So I, I don't see how it's a, an insult, but hey ho, that's, that's where we're at. And it is, it's ultimately about crossing bridges through which both sides can walk. And if that means not using a certain word, then so be it. People often decry things like this mm -hmm. as political correctness gone mad, but I think oftentimes it just comes down to politeness, doesn't it? It comes down to someone saying, mm -hmm. I don't want to be referred to as this term, in the same way I might say, my name's Ollie, yep. refer to me as that, or my name's Mary, refer to me as that. I mean, that is, that's as far as it goes, surely. Exactly. Um, and I think when people say, 
oh, it's political correctness gone mad. What they are actually saying is that they just don't like a different viewpoint. And that's not good enough for me, that's lazy. Um, and that's everything that we've been trying to campaign against, whether it be in economics, whether it be social issues, whether it be inequality, whatever it is, um, that is something that you've got to tackle. And I think as well that part of the reason why we're seeing so many people this seeming backlash to all this political correctness is because we've really made progress and now people who normally would have no interaction with trans people, with LGBT, with different religions, with different cultures, they are now suddenly hearing from voices that they didn't used to hear from and they just don't like it. So when people say, oh, that's, that's political correctness gone mad, I immediately go, you've not thought about this properly because if that is all that your argument is, then you've not got one. They can go and they sign a declaration that states their intention, um, that says that if they're found to have done this for fraudulent reasons, that it's up to, I think it's two years, was the suggested amount in, in prison. So it's a legitimate legal document. I mean, it's if you say, ah, just anybody can get that, it, you know, well, yes, but it's a, a legal document, so it's a big deal if you want to get it. Um, so it's just basically about removing all the really horrible barriers to trans people being able to live their lives as they are. Um, but that's where we're seeing all of these voices coming out the woodwork saying, well, that means that you could go in and, and change to a woman tomorrow. Well, yes, you actually could do that, but your life would be hellish after it. Do you think trans people have a decent you know, quality of life when they face so much discrimination and bigotry and just outright disgust at their very presence. Never mind, you know, no matter what they do, they still won't be acceptable to some people. That's a horrible, horrible thing. So anything that we can do to make that their lives a bit easier so they can go about their business is worth doing. Um, and from what we've seen in other countries, because this is the thing, we're not the first ones to suggest this idea. It's actually common practice internationally. It's recognised that self-ID is the best system. Um, we've got Ireland, Malta, Denmark, um, and none of these places have seen these swathes of rapists and perverts suddenly identifying as women. It just doesn't happen. Um, so I, I think a lot of the stuff just now is based on uh, misconceptions and outright lies. I wanted to ask you if there's any legitimacy, which clearly there isn't, but to ask you about whether the argument that people are putting mm. out against it is that, you know, predatory men essentially are going yeah. to use self-ID to gain access mm -hmm. to female-only spaces like changing rooms or mm -hmm. toilets or prisons or whatever, and obviously that's not mm -hmm. the case. No, because, well, for a start, say your example of a toilet or a changing room, what is stopping a guy putting on a dress and going in just now and doing that? There's literally nothing. In an actual fact, the very point that trans people have been using these single service, uh, single sex services for years without anybody batting an eyelid tells you just how it's just how small of an issue it is. It's not an issue. It doesn't exist. Um, so it's, it's people creating these, you know, hyperbolic situations that make no sense in the real world or have any kind of relevance. What's the best way to address people then who'd frame trans people and often mm -hmm. actually specifically trans women mm -hmm. as a threat? Well, you see, for me, this is where I think the feminist argument falls down, uh, or the trans exclusionary feminist argument falls down, because if what, what I think is that the point of feminism is to deconstruct the patriarchy and it's accepting that, you know, hetero straight men have just been in charge for far too long and our entire worldview has been shaped by that, whether we like it or not. Now, the only way to challenge that is by recognising, well, how does this actually permeate into every different group? And that's where I find, well, trans women actually have more in common with women than they do with men because they experience the same sexual violence, the same physical violence. But when you throw on top of that, that they're also excluded now from female places, well, where are they supposed to go if everybody's hating them? Um, so for me, that's that's not an argument. And if anything, what you then start doing is 
you you basically are setting the precedent that you will only accept trans people who pass, and that's then when you get in. When I think you start to expose the real misogyny uh, that hides behind a feminist argument, because I mean, by going by what passes, that I pass as a woman. I mean, I'm regularly told I want to be a man, but just by the fact that I dress differently and always have. Now I'm not trans. I'm a woman. But my entire life, I've felt excluded quite often from female conversations or female groups because I sit and I listen and I go, that's not been my experience in the slightest. Um, so what they're doing is they're creating a situation whereby, why should a woman feel emboldened enough to challenge me going into a toilet? Excuse me, can I see your gender certificate? No, you can't, I'm a woman. Well, could you prove it for me? Would you want to look at my bits? What? You're the pervert there, not me, so why am I being labelled on? <laughs> uh, and that's basically what the whole... why it's causing so much pain to the trans community because I think that so many women in particular, but guys are driving it as well, a lot of famous guys, are pushing this narrative that women have to reclaim what is hard fought for. Nobody's taking that away from you. If anything, it's about challenging that very binary and heterosexual worldview that has been forced on women and has also been forced on, you know, different communities. Even if you look at uh, straight men, how the patriarchy has affected them. Well, you've got guys who can't control their emotions without violence. You've got suicide rates, male suicide rates through the roof because our guys can't talk about their emotions. No, that's, that's if you're a manly man, no, you just get on with it, don't you? So it's. It, if anything, by arguing against the trans inclus inclusivity, you're reinforcing all these outdated worldviews that I don't fit into. So, uh, you know, I, I struggle to see how that's progressive. Um, you know, and I often wonder if it's actually, we're now at the stage where a lot of the women who are, you know, raising concerns about this, have fought all their lives and they have won a lot of rights that benefit me. However, in the same way that they used to look at the older generation and think, mm, I appreciate you've got this far, but there's more to do. I wonder if this is now a generational thing of going, we're now looking at the older ones going, guys, this isn't quite working. So whether that's the case or not, I don't know, but I think there could be an element of that. Who are you thinking of there? Uh, oh, there's quite a few jumping to me. <laughs> 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 Most on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Your, do you think your experience, mm -hmm. yourself being excluded as a gay woman, mm -hmm. do you think that's been a factor in you standing in solidarity with trans oh, people? Oh, completely, completely. Because, the, in fact, it was, uh, oh, what's her name? Ruth. Uh, she was the head of Stonewall. She just resigned. Glasses, always wears a suit. Oh, it's going to annoy me. Anyway, Ruth, uh, she did a, an article or an interview recently where she made that exact point because she's a very butch lesbian. Uh, she's now getting challenged in toilets with folk trying to say that she's a, a trans guy. Um, and the way she put it was she said, when you're in that moment where you're being challenged in a toilet, you're powerless. What you need is the person standing beside you to go, hold on a minute, the person with the power. And that's where... I'm recognising that the reason the LGBT has survived together is because everybody within the LGBT community is different and has different stories and different experiences, but we've all got common threads. And that's where we've really united as a community and that we really don't fit into this really Christian, heterosexual, binary worldview. And in actual fact, if you look for beyond thousands of years, there's always been evidence of third gender as such, you know, whether it be two spirit people in uh, Native America, India's had its own history. You go all over the world, you see that we exist and we survive because we are natural. If anything, the people who are unnatural are the ones trying to force this entire system on us and trying to tell us, here's what you should be able to do. And you no, know, I want to be able to go into a room where I know exactly what's in people's pants. What a weird thing to say, do you know what I mean? And like that when you're saying about changing rooms and bathrooms, well, to be honest, the vast majority of changing rooms are communal because they have cubicles. You know, because 
it's not a case of me being uncomfortable getting changed in front of a guy with a penis and a big hairy beard. It's me being uncomfortable getting changed in front of anybody. I don't want to be getting naked beside <laughs> randomers. Mm -hmm. uh, so we build cubicles. The same thing with toilets. Do you know, people, there seems to be this assumption that, you know, women have the right to a female toilet. No, you don't. The premise that you are on decides what the toilet arrangements are. In your own house, do you have gendered toilets? No, you don't. You go in, you do your business and you get out. There is nothing enjoyable about it. The same when you're out in public. You want it over as soon as possible so you can get it. So I, I really, I don't, I think a lot of it is just, you know, overinflated and ex exaggerated and it's, it's quite a moral panic, to be it, honest. It was uh, Ruth Hunt who Ruth was Hunt, the, the head of Stonewall. Um, talking about that binary worldview, yeah. how complicit do you think the right-wing press have been completely. in fostering these attitudes towards trans people? Oh, completely. I mean, I'm, I think recently there was a study done and the disproportionate amount of anti-trans stories that, which were filled with inaccuracies, by the way. Most of them had to issue apologies later on and, you know, page 15 behind the sports section or whatever. But, um, yeah, no, completely they've been complicit because it's... This is actually the logic I'll say to people about the Tory party, right, as an example. Conservatives, I think, find success often because when they say their belief in one sentence, it sounds, like, unarguable. You know, if you're not working, then I shouldn't have to pay for you. That sounds like a totally reasonable position. But let's flesh it out a wee bit and put it in context of the world as we live in it. No, that just makes you horrible because people are in different situations and that's how we've got a welfare state. So it, I say that about every Tory policy. You read it as one line, it sounds great, but flesh it out and you see that actually it causes a lot of damage. Well, it's, it's much the same for the right-wing press, they go with that one easy-to-understand headline where you think, of course that's outrageous, but the minute you pick it apart, you realise there is no real problem here, other than I didn't expect to arrive at this opinion. You mentioned the phrase turf earlier. Yeah. And that fits into, or is at least part of, not always, mm -hmm. the sort of the the culture of cancellation, if you like, mm -hmm. within, certainly on Twitter, but also just within liberal circles. Do you think that that term, that approach, often the competition almost to be more woke or mm -hmm. woker than someone else, do you think that's helpful? Do you think that's constructive for trans and LGBT rights? If you know how to do it, yes, but the problem you is loads of folk don't. I mean, my, my whole pro. thing has been, look, see if someone says something that I can't answer, I need to go away and think about it. But see if I've thought everything through and I've genuinely provided an answer for everything and I still can't figure out, and I don't think you can even figure out what your issue is, what do you want me to do with that? Mm. You know, so I, I think that this automatic assumption that because I am a woman, therefore my opinion is more accurate than anybody else's on this, well, no, not if you're an uninformed woman. I mean, if you're a woman who's never met a trans person in your life, or who's never taken the time to actually understand things, then no, you're, you're failing at it. It's the same way where, you know, people think that racism has to come from a, a place of hatred or homophobia has to come from a place of hatred. And that's what we see a lot of people getting upset that they're called transphobe because I'm not being hateful. How am I transphobic? Well, in actual fact, you can be racist without being hateful and that's, a part of the whole practice of listening. I'm not an expert on race, but see if loads and loads of BAME people were telling me, by the way, Mary, I think you're a bit out of line with that, or do you realise that when you say these things, it actually perpetuates myths and things? If I choose not to listen to that, then I'm the one choosing to stay ignorant. And I think exactly the same thing's happening with the trans community just now is people are saying, look, that's transphobic. I'm not calling you a transphobe. I'm just saying, have some self-awareness. And if people are sitting there genuinely going, I can't see for the life of me where I've been a transphobe, then you need to do work because that person isn't making it up. And it's how you've got to marry up these two and try to understand different moral views. And that's where I suppose, in my personal experience, I kind of feel like the middleman almost in that sense where I am a woman, I've been, you know, I've experienced life as a woman, but at the same time, I've also had almost one foot in the 
the male stereotypical world, being a season ticket holder, all my pals were boys, you know, I'm into football, it's, look at me, <laughs> you know, it's, it's that kind of, I'm not exactly the most feminine, so uh, I, I can kind of see it from both sides, and I think that's where I, I do feel a lot of frustration, particularly from cis women, when I go, look, I get it, you've had a hard time in your life, but this isn't a, a victim competition. This is about appreciating how different people are affected by things and seeing where we can marry it up. And that's where there's a hell of a lot that they have in common, mm. particularly trans women and cis women. Um, and equally, when I was talking about the, the misogic, uh, misogynistic part of this trans debate, when do we ever hear of trans men being talked about? Now, that is because these women are coming from the point of view that a woman can't be dangerous to me. Only a man can be dangerous to me. That's not true. I have met dangerous women. It, you know, your genitalia does not decide which, you know, what your actions in life are going to be. Mm -hmm. People are people. Where we notice trends, yes, of course, we should try and understand them, but it doesn't mean that people are inherently going to be a certain way if you know what I mean. So you can't have it both ways. Um, so I think there is a fundamental conversation that has to be had there. Uh, and But and on the whole, yes, I think if, if someone is good enough to qualify for a sport, then by all means go for it. Um, just because you're trans, that's only one part of who mm -hmm. you are, the same way as just because you run fast. It's part of who you are rather than being connected to your genitals. I think the concern often is around contact sport and mm -hmm. potentially um, cis males having a higher muscle density, being mm -hmm. stronger, and then potentially the risk that that could pose to yeah. other people potentially seriously injuring yeah. them as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Whereas perhaps in something like football, running, as you've mentioned already, then when there's less of a risk to an individual's mm -hmm. health, I think that becomes a much more complex well, that's area. Um, where well, two points. First one, the, that's kind of the thing I'm trying to talk about. Why then do sports not go away and say, right, in order to compete for this, you need to be within this weight category. You need to have these certain features, da, 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 these set of skills, and then you compete. Because if you're trying to tell me that every single man on this planet has a higher mu muscle density than Serena Williams, you know, you're at it. And if we had longer, we could go through and pick through the number of people that fall out with that uh, assumption. So I, I do I think that sport is lagging behind in many respects, and I think that's starting to show. But the second point I was going to make is, much like the toilet arguments, the one that you've just made about sport is also a, it's just a, a thought example. There is no evidence to suggest that's happened. So, uh, I mean, trans people, like I say, have been about for years. There have been, how many trans people have won the Olympics? None. Trans people make up less than 1% of the population. You try to tell me they're going, that less than 1% are all going to become incredible at sports and they're all going to make sure that your daughter doesn't win. Right, it just, no, it's not, it does, the world doesn't work like that. Um, so I think a lot of people are putting their fears and you know, and they're allowing their own fears to drive their thoughts a lot. Projecting their own insecurities. Yeah. On the 50th anniversary mm -hmm. of the Stonewall Uprising, Theresa May tweeted, and I quote, it's 50 years since the Stonewall riots changed the global LGBT rights movement forever. I'm proud to be the PM of a country consistently ranked among the most LGBT friendly places in the world and look forward to hosting a pride reception at number 10 next week. How does it feel to hear that from a prime minister who voted to maintain mm -hmm. section 28 and against equal marriage? It is what it is, is my honest answer, because there's, there's two sides to everything, basically see any social movement or anything that wants to progress. Ultimately, you only do it if you bring people with you. Um, and that's always been the struggle of the LGBT community is that we are constantly bombarded by folk trying to tell us, do not associate with these, these freaks, these perverts. Um, and we've started to break through that. Um, but we are nowhere near to a place of equality yet. Um, and when you see people like that, Theresa May, who obviously 
has a terrible record with LGBT rights, is now suddenly joined the bandwagon and is going along. Yes, it annoys me and I think, you know, I don't have much respect for her as a politician, but I never did anyway, so no harm lost there. But I'm glad that she's jumping on our bandwagon because what if it was the other bandwagon? What if it was the, you know, of the Christian church? If she was throwing her weight behind that, what did what would that then mean for LGBT rights? So I'm glad that it's now become the main narrative. Look, just be nice to LGBT people. It's, we do exist and we're not going to bite you or, you know, make you gay or anything. It's, but at the same time, we're that's only the first step on the ladder because a lot of folks think, right, well, now you can get married, so what are you talking about? You're not equal. I think, oh, there's still so much rage and inequality that it's more than that. And that's how, like, recently when I did a, a speech in the chamber on trans issues, I said that being an LGBT ally is more than just being nice to gay people or it's just more than being nice to LGBT folk. It's about actually trying to absorb and understand how different the world is for us than it has been for you guys. And appreciate and try to understand why I do feel so much solidarity with a trans woman, you know, many of whom are the most fabulous, beautiful looking creatures that have ever graced the earth. What have I got in common with them? But here I am standing right beside them because actually I do have a lot in common with them in that because we aren't the way that people expect us to be, we have to live every day justifying our existence. Why? Why do, why do I need to justify myself to any of you? Why do I need to prove to you that I'm a woman? All I want to do is use the toilet. Why do I need to prove to you that I've got a gender recognition certificate? All I came here today was have a yoga class. You've got the problem, not me. You know, and I think that's where we need to start, that's where we need to fight back to this sort of narrative because the minute they go for the T, it'll be the B next, then it'll be the G, then it'll be the L. Because even when you look around the world right now, we the LGBT people don't have a lot of rights. You know, there's, what, 70 countries where homosexuality is a crime. I think 33 or 35 countries, or Commonwealth countries, still have a same-sex sexual activity as being a crime. And the only reason that these countries have those laws now is because they came from the colonial area when we went and invaded them. So how can you possibly... How are we at a point where Theresa May is uh, tweeting about LGBT issues, clearly not having, you know, lived <laughs> or prov proved her stance, and yet she's in charge of the very institution that instilled homophobia and transphobia and whipped up hatred in all of these countries halfway around the world, where, as I've mentioned before, they actually had their own cultures, which were inclusive of trans people very often. So this is a problem of our creating. And if you can't see your existence in the context of the world, whether it be the world as your street, or the world being Scotland, or the world being the UK, or the world being the world, whatever it is, you have to see it in context and try to understand different points of view. And that's what I think is really missing from that side of the debate. What do you think this government's legacy will be then on LGBT rights? Uh, deporting people back to countries that are going to kill them. You know, and that's the fact is when I said, yes, I'm glad that Theresa May's you know, feeling like for appearance sake, she has to go jump onto her bandwagon. That shows we're at least in the right direction. But while she's tweeting that, you've got folk going back to some of the most dangerous places in the world, as I've just said, which are only dangerous because of our legacy in them. And yet, we're this big, you know, pro-LGBT country. Nah, I can't go online without reading rampant homophobia, transphobia, um, misogyny, and that's what really, really gets under my skin in particular with cis women who have their backs so up against uh, trans people is that they can't see the misogyny behind that, the misogyny that drives their expectation of how people should behave. Um, so that uh, that's where I suppose my experience, like I say, kind of ties in mm -hmm. with it. So I think that's 
government's legacy will be utter chaos and not a sincere thing done. Because um, I truly can't think of a sincere thing that this government have done, even the one before them <laughs> in 2015. There's, there's no sincerity there with anything. Mm -hmm. um, it's just for whatever shows good appearance, whatever gets the headline and ticks the box. So we, it's clear there's still hunters a lot to do. On that subject of jumping on the bandwagon, mm -hmm. what's your assessment of the increasing commercialisation of Pride, these big multinational companies mm -hmm. joining in the solidarity movement? Do you, do you think it's credible? I think it's it falls into the same category as Theresa May's tweet in that if all these big companies and everything, if they're wanting to be part of our party and our big celebration, by all means, you jump in. But I tell you what, here's the conditions. See if you think that you're going to be celebrating down, uh, you know, NYC, big pride, but then you're still going to take money for Saudis who quite often lock up folk. Well, I quite have an issue with that. Or if you're still supporting or holding up governments and institutions in places like Russia, where, I mean, thank God I wasn't born there because I probably wouldn't be alive to even speak just now. Um, so I think that we've got to make it a point where, yes, everyone is invited to join in, but do your homework. Make sure that you know why you're coming to march and things. So I, I think people are right to, not necessarily to criticise companies, but to highlight and point out, look, are you living up to what you're preaching? Um, and I think that goes, <laughs> that goes for a lot of people. Just finally. Mm -hmm. In Birmingham, we've seen parents protesting their children being taught age-appropriate LGBT yeah. education. About human existence. Yeah. Yeah. What's your assessment of that? That's terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. And I think, and this is why, quite honestly, I, I really do sometimes struggle to understand why cis women can be so passionate, or some cis women can be so passionately against trans rights because I just think, are you not seeing the similarities? Uh, because the idea, I mean, the problem, why we've been had to fight homophobia and everything is that in the same way that our institutions were built in a sexist, misogynistic world that did not rape women whatsoever, and we're still battling to try and undo that, well, these institutions were also created to be incredibly homophobic and binary. So, that's, I, I'm not understanding why they can't sort of make the connect there. In Birmingham, that's where I think that we see how religion influences, um, has still influenced all our institutions. And where religion has influenced institutions, you find that it's very heterosexual and binary. Um, and I've always been of the opinion that Church should have absolutely nothing to do with law, nothing to do with state. I think that's pretty self-evident as to why. Um, now, if a, a community or a group of people do genuinely have their belief that I am perverted and that I am going to hell um, and that I'm, you know, eternal damnation, I can live with that. That's fine. But go and think about it on your own turf. You do that in your churches, you do that in your mosques, you do that wherever you want. Don't you dare do that anywhere near a place of education. School's meant to be the one place where it doesn't matter the background, the wealth, or the parents of any child. The whole point is you get into that building and you all get taught, here's how the world works, here's what you need to know and the skills you need to develop in order to survive. And if you are indoctrinating children into believing that gay people don't exist and when they do exist, they're perverts or they're, they've to be pitied or uh, saved in some shape or form, then no, that's not on because that's a lie and it is a lie based on your belief, which I do not share. And you, like I say, have every right to believe that, but do it on your own turf. Get it away from me. The same way if, you know, like, I myself, I'm, I was baptised a Catholic, and I remember when uh, gay marriage was getting debated, uh, and well, that Catholic church were out in force against it. And I just remember thinking, I can't understand their logic either, because they don't believe that people should be allowed to get married or transition or anything like that. And that's why 
they will never do a Catholic service for it. That's fine. But if I don't want a Catholic service, why have you got any right to tell me what I can and can't do mm. or to influence law? Because the whole point is law is supposed to apply to everybody, no matter how unique they are. And so I, Birmingham, I just see as being really scary. It's the start of a slippery slope that we already know where it ends up. Um, so if, if people, you know, think that LGBT uh, people are equal and that we've, we've got our equality and everything, they, they really are living with their head in the sand uh, and telling themselves what they want to believe. It's a sad place to leave it, but Mary Black, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank no, you. Cheers. Thank you, man.